and welcome to The Spectrum Show, a show dedicated to the Sinclair ZX Spectrum. Welcome to the new series. Coming up in this episode, we take a look back to January 1984 to get all the Sinclair news and latest Spectrum games. We check out the Karar speech unit. We take a look back at some old Abex games. And look at some newer titles. But first, it's into the time machine and back to January 1984. A recent deal between CRL and ORP will see the release of a game based on H.G. Wells' book War of the Worlds. The game will be released on six home micros, including the Spectrum, early this year. The game, according to CRL, is already in progress and will take the form of ten separate mini arcade games, each representing an element of the story. The first releases will be for the Oricon Spectrum on March the 1st. Herg, the game creation tool from Melbourne House, has been delayed due to what the publisher calls unforeseen difficulties. Originally set for release last October, the problems have seen the release date slip. Melbourne House says it's nearly ready, with just a few small tweaks needed to complete it. Sinclair has reduced the price of some of its ROM titles for the new interface too. Six titles being Space Raiders, Planetoids, Psst, Cookie, Hungry Horus and Horus and the Spiders are now selling for 9 95 the remaining titles, Jetpack, Transam, Chess and Backgammon, are still selling for the original $14.95. Finally, Sinclair launched its new, much boasted about micro, the Sinclair QL. The 68000 16-bit processor-based machine includes twin microdrives and has a startling price of £399. The machine will come with a set of business tools including a spreadsheet, a database and word processor. The big news is that the machine will not be backward compatible with the Spectrum in any form, despite early rumours claiming that a Z80 CPU would also be included to provide this functionality. And now the new releases. Coming into the charts is Death Chase from Micromega, a brilliant game that is often the top of Spectrum games charts even today. We have the animated adventure Oracle's Cave from Doric. Imagine also moving to the arcade adventure with Alchemist. And finally, Mr. Wimpy from Ocean, which, despite the first screen, was really a Burger Time clone. And that was all the news and games from January 1984. We've all seen movies and television shows that depict computers that could talk. Some in realistic human voices, others in a metallic and robotic way. So when a small add-on arrived in the market in 1983 that promised to give your Spectrum the same functionality, I was eager to get one and hear what my micro had to say. The unit was quite small and offered the added bonus of allowing your Spectrum sound to be outputted through your television speaker. Connecting it up was easy. Just plug it into the expansion port, remove the aerial from the Spectrum and plug that into the Karai unit, Take the lead from the Karai unit and plug it into the aerial socket of the Spectrum. And finally, take the 3.5mm jack from the Karai unit and plug it into the mic socket. This would allow the sound to be redirected to the television. The unit had no pass-through port though, so it had to be the last device in the chain if you had anything like joystick interfaces already plugged in. Once that's done, you're ready to go. Using the small screw on top of the device allowed you to fine-tune the audio output so you could get the sound just right. Once connected and the Spectrum powered up, it was time to make it talk. By default it's turned on, and so pressing a key would prompt the unit to speak the input command. This could be turned off easily using the reserve variable keys. The unit used the S$ variable, so anything set within that would be picked up and sent out to the speech interpreter, so programming it in BASIC was very simple. The results were not always perfect, and to get it to pronounce things correctly you had to play around with various syntax options. You could swap out letters, for example C and K, or you could wrap letters in brackets to produce a new sound. Hello. A typical sentence could take a while to get just right. For example, if you wanted to say, hello YouTube, this is your Spectrum talking, you would have to type in something like this. To be honest, I spent a lot of time making it swear. 
no doubt along with hundreds of other kids just to annoy their parents. The unit used up some of the Spectrum's memory as well, taking up 256 bytes and moving the user-definable graphics down. This caused problems with several games. The ability to speak was taken up by many games companies adding speech to their games. The effects were underwhelming for me and didn't actually add anything to the game. One game though had a trick up its sleeve. Booty from Firebird Software detected if the device was connected and if it was, you got a completely different game. Curar was acquired by DKtronics in 1985 and slowly the unit went out of favour with DKtronics pushing their own speech unit instead. At the end of the day though it was just a bit of fun and never really took off. And even today with the exception of maybe satellite navigation or Apple's Siri, computers that talk have never really made it into our homes. The only exception probably would be for sight impaired people. So to sum up then, it's a bit of fun to mess about with, but the novelty soon wears off. Abex, for me, had quite a high profile in the early days of the Spectrum, mainly down to the game based on Steven Spielberg's film E.T., which we'll review shortly. The company had a relatively short run, producing only 16 games between 1982 and when they went into liquidation in late 1984. A lot of the games are missing in action, and the remaining games vary greatly in quality. The first one we'll look at is All or Nothing. Released in 1984, this game sees you parachuting into an enemy camp trying to locate and steal secret files. You only have 10 minutes to do this, so time is of the essence. To get the secret files you have to first enter the office and crack the 4 digit code. This will give you a key and a gun. The key will open one of 9 warehouses, in which you'll find other useful items like ammunition or radio transmitters, and of course the key to the next warehouse. In the last warehouse you'll find the secret files, but obviously you have to get there first, all the time trying to keep out of the way of the guards and their dogs, and of course, keeping an eye on the time. You can shoot the guards and search them. This may turn up some useful items like ID cards that can give you immunity for a short period of time. You can also gas them, which to me is a little bit in bad taste, but luckily it only stuns them and allows you to search them again. You can also create diversions by using explosives. Down to the game itself, and controls are a little awkward, sometimes not responding, causing you to get stuck and allow guards to close in. You have to rotate left and right and then use the forward key to move, rather like ant attack, only less responsive. Other keys allow you to select an item and use it. Doing things takes up time, so for instance when you are trying a door you have to wait a few seconds. But during this time the guards and their dogs keep moving and can attack you. The graphics are in 3D and the scroll is character based and the playing area isn't too big to make things difficult. The guards and their dogs are a bit basic and the player only has two frames of animation. The colours are a bit strange as well. Why is the ground magenta? Surely it should have been green or yellow or even better black and have the game being played at night. The sound is very limited with just a few clicks and beeps when you try to open a door or get shot. If you pass behind one of the walls the viewing angle changes automatically, which, although nice, it can cause confusion. The game in general is not too bad, and had the controls been a bit more responsive it would have been much better. Because of the time limit the action has to be continuous, which gives it an edge. Overall, not a bad game for 1984, and the 3D aspect made sure that it scored well in magazines. For me though, the idea was better than the execution, and all that waiting for actions and doors to be opened ruined the flow of the game. But don't let that stop you giving it a try. ETX is a maze chase adventure get arcade mashup thing that obviously takes ideas from the film. The general idea is that you have to guide the little alien chap around 16 screens looking for parts of his transmitter so they can phone home and get off the planet. All of the time he's being chased by an MI5 agent and a mad professor. There are options at the start of the game to select who you want to chase him, which in turn alters the difficulty. If you just play the game with Ernie, 
who is E.T.'s friend, the game can be a little boring and just involves running around falling down a lot of holes. Adding one or both of the others, i.e. the MI5 agent or the Mad Professor, turns it into a hectic scramble and avoid game. Ouch. The gameplay, no matter which option you choose, just involves E.T. running around falling into lots of pits and hoping that there's something in the bottom of them. You can get help from Ernie, who, when plied with ten items of fruit, will give up a piece of the transmitter. What kind of friend is that? I mean, if he's your friend, surely you'd give the transmitter anyway. Certain areas of the game allow you to do certain things. For example, one area allows E.T. to call Ernie, and others transport E.T. to another screen. This sometimes happened randomly for no reason I could see. The border effects are nice at the start, but they soon get boring and irritating after you've fallen down the 100th pit, only to discover nothing there. The high point of the game is obviously the speech, which is excellent. The rest of the game relied on this for sales, and no doubt a lot of people were disappointed when they actually played the thing. Having said that, a certain magazine actually gave it 100%, a rating higher than Jetpack. I mean, what was the review of smoking? Honestly, is this better than Jetpack? Famously, the Atari 2600 version bombed and was sent away in their millions to become landfill. It's just a pity this one wasn't given the same treatment. Retro Invaders was released in 2011 by Climacus. At least I hope that's how you pronounce it. The name would suggest a new version of an old game done in a new style but in a retro fashion. Yeah, it had me worried as well, but as it turns out it's a great game, and strangely some distance from a Space Invader clone. The game has more in common with an arcade favourite of mine, Gyrus. The player controls a ship that travels around the outer edges of the screen, shooting invaders as they come from the centre, just like Gyrus. There are multiple levels with a host of different invaders to take care of, some firing, some not. At the end of each stage there's a boss fight, providing a break from the invader attacks and throwing in some additional skills to work out the best method of dispatching them. The game comes in two flavours, 48k and 128k. The one that's being played here is the 128k version. The only difference between the two is obviously sound, the AY being used instead of the beeper, and the background planets are emitted on the smaller machine. Because this is a Spectrum game, especially a fast-moving arcade game, colour is used sparingly, providing mono displays only for each level. This does not distract from the game at all though, and it's a great little blaster. Sound on the 128 machine is supplemented with some excellent music and the effects recreate the arcade sounds of yesteryear. The 48k version, as mentioned before, does have paper music but can't match the 128k version. If you like arcade shooters, especially Gyrus, then you'll love this game. Another great release for the Spectrum. That's the end of this episode. I hope you enjoyed it. If you want to help making the next one, get in touch via the details below. See you soon.